right. We're going to be continuing in our study in Romans, and I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. It will be on the screen. If you have your Bible, you can follow along. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. For all, ha for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. God is good? All the time? Do you believe that? And I heard a lot of yeses. I wonder if there's a no out there. And if there's not, and if there is a no out there, Lord, I just ask by the power of the Holy Spirit that you just reveal who you are today to that person. Um, I just ask that in Jesus' name. So we're in Romans, and it seems to go from bad to worse. <laughs> um, Jonathan Edwards, uh, one of the, uh, he's known as one of the greatest American theological minds known to man. Uh, was preaching on the eternal damnation of hell. It was a very heavy message. He was speaking about the judgment of God. And as he was preaching, somebody from the audience said, Mr. Edwards, is there no mercy with God? And Edwards told him that he needed to wait till the next Sabbath before he got to that part of the message. <laughs> no doubt, I hope that many of us are feeling the dread and the drudge of these last through few weeks in Romans, and it's not going to get any better for a little while. Um, but I want to remind you of the first message in Romans where we spoke about Jehovah Tiskanu, the Lord our righteousness, that if you are in Christ Jesus, you are His righteousness. But we're not there yet. Um, we're in a tough portion of Scripture. And the whole idea, and Paul will keep mentioning themes over and over and over again, it says that the religious know that they are not righteous. And by religious, I mean we who try in our own efforts and strength to somehow, to some way, earn our own way into heaven so that we can stand at the doors and say, look at my list, God. Look at all the things that I have done. And that's generally what the religious do. So right here in this message, Paul is specifically talking to Jews that are in Rome. 
okay? For a Jew to think about an eternal damnation in hell under God's judgment would have been absurd. Hell was a place designed in God's judgments where His order and decree for sinners, for Gentiles, for those outside of the bloodline of Abraham. They would have believed that they were immune to the very wrath of God. And so they carried out their law with their heads held up high in purification and Sabbath. Their sins were atoned for once a year. They were a special people. I would beat my... But then the sound would be terrible. <laughs> they were a special people. Set aside from the rest of the filth. Did you hear that? Therefore you have no excuse, O man. By the way, O man is a clue that we're talking to the Jews because it was a very common term used in that day and age to describe a Jewish person with pride. So Paul, when he says, oh man, this is who he's talking about. They would have understood as readers of this in Rome who he was talking about. Therefore, you have no excuse, oh man, you religious person. That's how I'm going to translate that today because we don't understand Jewish culture. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges for a passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. They're no different than all of us. And as the law shuts our mouth, the gospel shuts our mouth, we are without excuse. Paul is talking about the hypocrisy of the church. Now, when I say hypocrisy, I'm not talking about somebody who goes out, sins and falls, and then comes to church, because that's what the world says. Oh, I don't want to go to church. It's full of hypocrites. I love how Ray Comfort addressed that. What, do you go to the movie theater? That's full of hypocrites. Don't stop you, right? But, but what he's talking about is those that God has given the law to, to translate and to uphold and 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 they're judging and they're not abiding by the word of God. The hypocrisy of the church. But anytime we think that we are beyond God's judgment because of our goodness, we are in danger. Anytime. I heard this years ago, the human is the only one when you pat himself on the back, his head swells. Jesus told a parable, and I'm not going to go into the parable, and I'm going to plant a seed here today. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even this tax collector. I wasn't pointing at you, Sean. <laughs> It was El No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <sighs> Look. Everybody falls into this. I don't care who you are. Everybody at one time or another has looked at somebody else and thought, I am better than that person. I don't know why that is within the human, but it's sin. Here it's the religious leaders. But whenever we're in a position of ministry, we need humility. Humility. Paul had an affliction. I don't know what it was, but it was to humble him. It was to keep him humble. God will cause pain in your life to keep you humble because he loves the world. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave it. Well, in order to love the world, we need to step out of ourselves. 
Because when we stay in ourselves, we're not kind and loving people. I mean, we may appear that way. But God judges motive, deed, and heart. You know, the tax collector said, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's humility. That's humility. That's somebody that's going before God and, and understands the condition of the heart. The text, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will not escape the judgment of God? And what was true of Israel then applies to us today. You heard that, Jeff? It applies to us today. What was being said thousands of years ago, we had that conversation. Last week, we looked at a whole list of sins that we're to be held accountable for. We, uh, homosexuality, unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, gossip, slander, haters of God, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And I intentionally left out like five of them. Because that's what we do. We take these lists and we check off. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I'm good, I'm good. Oh, I struggle there. Let me circle that and talk to the pastor. That's not what the list is about. The list is not about just homosexuality. It's not just about ruthlessness. It's not just about haters of God. It's to say to every one of us, we're fallen. That's why it's a big list. That's why it's all there. <laughs> Again, concise, not all there, excuse me. But we should fit into something there. Something should grab our hearts. And the worst sin isn't even mentioned on this list. Now, if you were paying attention, you know where I'm going to go. People who suppress the truth, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship the creator, the creation rather than the creator. As I read that, I made that same mistake earlier this morning, and I was like, man, I hope I don't do that there. They served the creature. And the way I can the way I can identify with that is I put myself on the throne constantly. Every time I'm angry at anybody. Anytime I'm not getting my way, anytime I'm gossiping, anytime I'm slandering, I'm exchanging the truth for a lie. It's important to understand that because we ignore the standard. We ignore the standard. Not one of us has any right to condemn another sinner. But we do it because we're better than. And we forget. We forget. We forget that God sent His Son to die on a cross on my behalf. It's on our behalf. I'm big on community. I, I, I don't like the saying, if I was the only person, Christ would die for me because I'm like, that was never the plan. It's always about community. But, but for the sake of you and I, let's make it personal. Jesus Christ died on a cross for me. Why? Because I was so good? <laughs> right? And there's some good people. There's some good people. And that's what Paul's saying. He's talking to people who were in charge of upholding the law who thought they were really good people. We're not talking about the worst of the worst. The bad seeds. The black sheep. We're talking about the ones that think they're upright before God on their own behalf. But you can't on your own behalf. You can't on your own. You need something else. And that something else is only found in one person, 
Jesus Christ. But we want to be satisfied here on earth. We want to feel the satisfactions and the joys of here on earth. So we will go looking. Prone to wander. Why do you think we sang that? Right? I'm laying down all my religion. Why do you think we sang that? How do we go back to the simple truth? The simple truth that I deserve wrath because I can't keep the standard. But God poured that wrath down on His Son so that I can be accepted. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness, that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. I love this verse right here because I should have preached it last week. Last week's message was on baptism, right? We baptized 12 people. And the whole message was why were you baptized? There's a symbol of repentance. I'm repenting before God. I am I'm turning my life around and I'm giving it to his <clears throat> What did John say? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and then people were baptized. Amen. Amen. None of us can stand at the judgment seat of God and say God, you are not fair. His kindness has made a way of an escape through the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. And we all have opportunity. Every person in here has opportunity to repent and turn to a loving God because He made a way. I said from bad to worse. To me, this is one of the scariest Scriptures in all the Bible. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you were storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. I really like the NIV here because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart. I think that really captures, right? I'm stubborn. <laughs> I can be unrepentive. Whew. God considers every sin we commit in thought, word, and deed. And it will be exposed on the perfect day of judgment according to to truth. A disciple of Jesus is called to carry their own cross. That's the cross. That's the heaviness. Is dying to the desires within your own heart to ignore God, to suppress the truth, to believe a lie, to serve and worship something other than God. And it doesn't matter what conclusion we come to. We are judged according to His standards because God is a good judge. He is a good God and will judge each of us according to our works. He will render to each one according to his work. Every time we sin, it's an indictment against ourselves. Treasuring up wrath on the day of judgment. Praise God. Our justification is by faith alone and Christ alone. Our rewards will be distributed in heaven according to each of our works. 
And I think that's why Jesus says, store up your things in heaven, in Matthew. I'm not going to expound on that. I would like you to. To those who by patient and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Here is the distinction that Paul makes, that God will give eternal life for those who are under the works of righteousness. Those who set their hearts on heaven. Those who believe the literal word when God says, and this is eternal life, that you believe in God and His Son, Jesus Christ. But for those who choose the wide and broad and easy road, it leads to destruction. And when you choose that road, you're choosing to ignore truth. And you're choosing to obey, not Satan, but your own sinful desires. Because you have those sinful desires and Satan will come in and play with it. That's his, that's his playground. Take away those toys and he doesn't have anything to play with. And there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. God's strictest judgment on evil. And again, what is evil? Suppressing the truth and believing a lie. It's not falling into the temptation of sin and repenting. It's believing that God doesn't exist. It's believing that, that there is no judgment. It's believing that there is no hell. It's believing that there is no heaven. You can't use the church card on the judgment day. Amen? Amen. I went to church every Sunday, guy. What you did to the least of these, you also do unto me. God will render each person according to their deeds. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, first, the, or the Jew first, and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. And before I go into this next section, um, I think there's a great misrepresentation uh, from from an evangelistic point of view. Is you can have these, believe it or not. Uh, but somehow, we believe, um, or we want people to know that, that Jesus saves, right? Well, that's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's why we're here, right? Um, but where we go wrong is when we think um, that if people don't believe in Jesus, they're judged. Um, we conclude that uh, if a person has not heard the gospel, has not heard about Jesus, then really there's no chance, and God is unfair. He's unjust. How could a good God send anyone to hell who's never had the opportunity to hear about Jesus? And so those remote places where people have never heard of Jesus, if they die and go to hell, that is just wrong. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. Nobody ever goes to hell. Nobody ever goes to hell because they have not heard the name of Jesus. Hell and wrath is set aside for those who have sinned. Those who have violated God's law. We're going to get a little deeper here as we talk about the law in this next. I'm just setting, setting a stage here. So that if somebody never heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
and they stand before the judgment seat of God, it's their sin that will separate them. Jesus is the good news that needs to be proclaimed. I somehow wonder if there's a stricter judgment on those who took what God has given them and buried it. That should be an ouch. Because there are people out there who've never heard the gospel and they need to. Because Jesus saves. And if you don't believe me, read John 3, 17. Okay. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. But that's for you to read later on. Here. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And the point is nobody can be justified rightly by keeping the law. If you broke one, you broke them all. And the standard is perfection. So where do we stand? The doers of the law must be perfect. And if you just look at that for what it is, you'll say, well, that's not what it says. But you keep reading this is the stage that Paul is setting to tenderize our hearts for the good news. It's to tenderize our hearts for the good news so that we go, I need help. Help me. I am a great person and then I read this and something's wrong. Somehow, how do I fit in? For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness with their conflicting thoughts accusing or accuse or even excuse them. And as Galatian puts it, the law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And God has put a conscience in your heart that bears witness with the law. So that if you've never picked up a Bible, you know it is wrong to murder, commit adultery, lie, and steal. Well, how? How do you know that? Because God put it there. That's what it's saying. The whole point of the sermon is to show us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm thinking two or three weeks we'll get there. Right? Do you see, you hear, like, like, let this brim and meditate on our hearts. And I want you to keep in mind, this is written to the religious, to the Jewish leaders. Next week, we're going to look a bit, a little bit more of the Jewish mindset and heart of why they kept the law. But God knows the hearts and thoughts of men. God gives each of us a general revelation of who He is through nature. So none of us are without excuse. We see the majesty, the glory of God here on earth. And we have His law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The only escape from wrath is a new heart. And you don't repent without a new heart. And you know who gives you a new heart? And I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Amen? 
That's the good news. If God has touched your heart, there is opportunity to repent of your religiousity. <laughs> of your ever saying to somebody else, I am better than you. And you have your reasons. I'm not going to go in, but you always have reasons. You always, there's always reasons. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We as Mennonites believe firmly on a priesthood of all believers. Priesthood of all believers. We are all on equal ground. And we are either building on the stone or building on the sand. But we're all on equal ground. And on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, you know our hearts. How do we stand? Help us to stand firmly on the faith that you have provided to give us that hope of the calling that you've set before us because of the person and work of Jesus Christ so that we can be imitators of God as dear children. Be glorified. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.